Hey friends, Anne here and welcome back to worship. I'm so glad that you have chosen to join us for worship today. We are moving through the book of First Peter and as we have been moving through it, we have been learning how we are called to be the church together. We talked about how we are together in hope and together in trials. Last week was together as a temple, a dwelling place for God and together as priests. Today we're going to talk about together together in love. And before we get started, what I'd like to do is ask y'all if you have any idea of what this is. Um, you can put your guess in the comments. Um, those of you who are familiar with science, maybe, um, or work in the medical field, or have recently taken a biology class, maybe, um, will know that this is a representation of a strand of DNA. I won't even pretend to know how to pronounce that whole word, but just DNA. And what is DNA? In case you are not currently in school or have not recently had this knowledge presented to you for the very first time. So DNA are kind of like the building blocks or it's kind of like the mind of your cells. So each cell in the body has a, a, a different purpose, right? There are collections of cells that are all the same, but yet each of them are united by the fact that they share the same DNA. And the same DNA is found in every cell in your body. It's the one thing that unites all of the cells in your body. It's almost kind of like the blueprint for your cells. It's kind of like the instruction manual, so to speak, um, so that all of these pieces fit together in the whole. So we could compare the DNA of the cell kind of like to the mind of the cell, that it all has the same mindset, even though the cells do different things within our bodies. So today we're going to be talking about what it looks like to have the same mindset or the same mind as Christ. What would that look like in terms of the body of Christ? Many times in scripture, the body of Christ or the church is referred to as a body made of different parts, but yet all working together to serve the, the whole and to serve the, the rest of the world. And so today we're going to be talking about what is it that unites us together as one body when each of us have different roles, each of us have different responsibilities and ways of doing and uh, ways of being within the church, giving our gifts and using our talents. But what is it that we should all share in common? What is that common DNA of the church? Well, let's talk about it from 1 Peter. We're going to be in 1 Peter and uh, chapter 3, verse 8 is where we're going to start. And it says this, Finally, all of you should be of one mind. Sympathize with each other, love each other as brothers and sisters, be tender hearted and keep a humble attitude. Don't repay evil for evil, don't retaliate with insults when people insult you. Instead, pay them back with a blessing. That is what God has called you to do, and He will grant you His blessing. Friends, we are called to be of one mind. Now, when we think about that for a moment, um, he says, each of you should be of one mind. So whose mind is that? Everybody should be like my mind or everybody should be like your mind. Everybody should be thinking like me or everybody should be thinking like you. Um, we may get that confused, but actually I think we all can agree that we all need to have the mind of Christ. If we look in this scripture right here um, from 1 Corinthians 2.16, it says, For who can know the Lord's thoughts? Who, know, who knows enough to teach him? But we understand these things because we have the mind of Christ. We seek to have a mind like Christ, not so that everybody has to think like me or everybody has to think like you and everybody else is wrong if they don't do that, but we seek to have the mind of Christ. And if you remember in the scripture that we just read, there were some key words that kind of describe the mind of Christ. 
Remember, he talks about sympathy, sympathizing with one another, having compassion on one another, being able to enter into someone's pain with them and being allowing yourself to feel deep empathy for that person. So there's sympathy. There's also love. Love each other as brothers and sisters. Friends, when we are together as the body of Christ, we are brothers and sisters. We are family. And let's not love each other like a dysfunctional family that gets in fights and feuds and holds grudges and all of that. This is meant to be a highly functional family, a loving family. So sympathy, love, be tenderhearted and keep a humble attitude. So humility is supposed to be a part of the mind that we share, that we are supposed to think of others better than ourselves, before ourselves, over ourselves. And we are to put, think of ourselves in the right place, not too highly, not too lowly, just as we are, um, just as we are in Christ. Don't repay evil, evil for evil. Don't retaliate. Um, instead, pay them back with a blessing. We are called to have the mindset that does not retaliate or get back at people for evil things, but actually repays them with a blessing. And then he talks about that that is what God has called you to do. And then he will grant you and me a blessing as well. So what is this shared mind of Christ? What is this DNA that we are to have? Um, we have heard things like sympathy, love, tenderhearted, humility, blessing. And what is it that is supposed to bind us all together? Here's another verse that I think speaks to this. Um, this idea of having one mind one DNA. John 13 35 says your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. So love is that big thing that binds us together. We are meant to be together in love. And if you look back at these other things that we talked about, sympathy, tenderheartedness, humility, blessing others, love is at the core of every single one of these. So we are called to be people that have the mindset of Christ, that all of us have love as the core of our DNA. All of us have love as the one thing that binds us together. We may have different experiences, we may have different personalities, we may have different gifts and ways of expressing ourselves, but love needs to be the one thing that binds us together as the body of Christ. One mind, and that mind is love. So let's go on and see what Peter says next about this idea of love. So he says that love is rewarded. In verse 10, for the scriptures say, if you want to enjoy life and see many happy days, keep your tongue from speaking evil and your lips from telling lies. Turn away from evil and do good. Search for peace and work to maintain it. The eyes of the Lord watch over those who do right, and his ears are open to their prayers. But the Lord turns his face against those who do evil. So here there is once again a visual picture of what love is. And notice that that Peter is saying that love is rewarded. He's actually quoting from Psalm 34, 12 through 16. So he's, he's going all the way back into the Old Testament and pulling out this passage to remind us that love is rewarded. Um, but the Lord turns his face against those who do evil. He does not reward those who do evil. But notice that the eyes of the Lord watch over those who do right, and his ears are open to their prayers. So when we operate out of a heart of love, out of a shared DNA or a shared mind of Christ that is focused and centered on love, that love is going to be rewarded by God. However, you and I have both experienced times in our lives when we have responded to people in love and it has not been rewarded. It has not been reciprocated by people. 
Just because it's rewarded by God doesn't mean that it is going to be universally rewarded. That if we are the most loving person, that we're never going to experience rejection or heartache or trouble or any of those things. No, as a matter of fact, Peter goes on to talk about what happens when our loving actions are actually rejected. Let's read in verse 13. Now, who will want to harm you if you are eager to do good? But even if you suffer for doing what is right, God will reward you for it. So don't worry or be afraid of their threats. Instead, you must worship Christ as Lord of your life. So here he's talking about what if you are operating from love in all that you do, you're doing good things for other people, you're loving other people, and yet you suffer for it. Notice that he says you must instead worship Christ as Lord of your life. If you experience this kind of rejection, this kind of suffering um, from other people, notice that he doesn't say, hey, try to make them happy. Do anything you can to make them happy. No, he says, note that he says that we are to worship Christ as Lord of our lives. We are to remember that even though we are not rewarded by other people for our loving actions, that our Savior always rewards us when we are true to the DNA that he has implanted within us. That we, when we operate with the one mind of Christ and we are doing the things that Christ would do, that we are to worship him because he is the one who sees us, who knows us, who loves us, even when others reject us. So in that moment when your love is not rewarded, but when your love is rejected, continue to worship because the one who made you sees you and he sees the good that you are doing. He sees the heart of love that you have for other people, even when other people do not see it. He goes on to tell us one more thing that we are to do if we are rejected. He says this at the end of verse 15. And if someone asks you about your hope as a believer, always be ready to explain it. But do this in a gentle and respectful way. Keep your conscience clear. Then if people speak against you, they will be ashamed when they see what a good life you live because you belong to Christ. Remember, it is better to suffer for doing good if that is what God wants than to suffer for doing wrong. Friends, this is a beautiful passage that reminds us that even when we are rejected because of our love, that we are called to give an answer for the love that we have in our hearts. We're not meant to defend ourselves. We're not meant to fight back against that rejection. But yet we are to allow our humble nature. We are, allow, we are um, encouraged to allow the integrity of our lives to shine through and to give a natural, humble, and gentle answer for the hope that we have in Christ. Remember, he says, do this in a gentle and respectful way. So even when we respond to rejection, we are still intended to do that with integrity. We are still intended to do that with a heart of love. Because friends, one of the things that we know is that very few people are going to respond to the gospel if it is forced on them, if it is pushed on them, if they are rejecting us and then we come back at them, rejecting them or putting them down, they are going to see our actions and notice that it does not match the heart of Christ that we are supposed to have. And he, and he tells us here that we are supposed to give an answer for ourselves, but let it be done in a gentle and respectful way. And remember that the best witness is for other people to see the goodness of God and the love of God shining through your life. That is so much more powerful than words, so much more powerful than any defense that you could give as a result of someone's rejection of you. 
Friends, he reminds us here in this passage that love must be at the center of all that we do, that love is the core, the DNA, the mind of Christ that we must have, and that Christ rewards that love when we show it to others, even when some people reject it. But he goes on to remind us of where this love comes from. He says this in verse 18. Christ suffered for our sins once for all time. He never sinned, but he died for sinners to bring you safely home to God. He suffered physical death, but he was raised to life in the spirit. Friends, we need to remember that we are called to love like Christ. That Christ didn't just love up to a point until he was rejected, but he loved past the reject, re rejection. He loved in spite of the rejection. He even loved because of the rejection. Friends, Christ's love goes on and on and on. And in the same way, we are to have the mind of Christ. We are to have at the core of our DNA a love that goes on and on and on, continues past any rejection. We are loving not to gain the approval of other people, but because we have been loved with so sacrificial a love that we cannot do anything else but love others back in that way. Friends, we are called to be together in love. As the church, we are united in love and by love, and that should be the primary thing that people see when they look at the church. Wow, all of these people are so different, but yet, they are united by the love that they have received from Christ and are showing in an outpouring out to others. So friends, what does that look like for you today? What does that look like in your life? As you look at the core of your DNA, what do you discover in every cell of your body? Is there the mind of Christ in every cell of your body? Is there the mind of Christ in every person within your church? Is there the mind of Christ among the church universal? Friends, I'd like to see that sometimes we see glimpses of that, but we know that we have not done this perfectly, that we as the church are still a work in progress. This year in 2024, we have a theme that says, we is greater than me. And as we look at the scripture today, we know that that is true, that we as the body of Christ are meant to have the mind of Christ, that we are to be united in our love for other people. We are to put other people above and before ourselves as we seek to love them as we have been loved. So what is the challenge here for you today in this teaching? How well are you loving? Are you loving conditionally, as long as people will approve of you and accept you? Or are you loving unconditionally, even when you are rejected by people? Do you love even to the point of suffering as Christ loved you? Friends, I can only imagine what it would look like if every single believer really did have the mind of Christ and that Christ's love had become a part of the very cells in their body so that every single one of us were united by the mind of Christ, united by our desire to love other people unconditionally and sacrificially. Friends, will you pray with me this week that that will become a reality more in our own lives just as it comes a, becomes a reality more in the lives of the church universal? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we know that we have failed you so many times. God, we know that there have been so many times that love has not been the motivator for our actions. 
Father, even in this moment as we are confessing this, even in this moment as instances come to our mind of times that we have failed you, that we have failed to be a unified body, that we have failed to be focused and centered around the mind of Christ, God, we just ask that you will bring to our hearts and our lives and every cell in our body renewal. God, a renewal and a recentering around the unconditional sacrificial love that you have shown us that we are called to show other people. God, help us to be reminded each and every day that together as the body of Christ, together as the church, we are called to have the same mind. We are called to be centered around the same love. And God, as we do that, we know that it will bring even more unity to us. It will be even more an accurate reflection of who you are to the world. God, change our hearts, change our minds. Help us to become more loving. Help us to become more focused on you. In your name I pray, amen. down to save me, making all things new. His goodness overwhelms me, His mercy is new each morning. Now I can't help but sing. You are worthy, King of glory, King of glory. is coming open up open up your ancient gates open up open up the king is coming who is this king of glory the lord so strong and mighty he's always faithful to forgive his favor goes before me Perfect love surrounds me Now I can't help but sing You are worthy King of glory King of glory Forever worthy King of glory King of glory Open up, open up, the King is coming. Open up, open up, you ancient gates. Open up, open up, the King is coming. The King is coming.